and good evening to everyone in Asia and hi everyone who is here in the UK or in Europe. Um, we are going to just do this in three phases. I'm going to do a very quick intro to 1% for the planet and then I'm going to hand over to Fred who's my co-committee me member to introduce the main event Rebecca um, and who will talk to us about rewilding Britain. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is our fourth UK event. Um, the first one was in the Conduit Club. So we had a live event in January. Some of you will have been there. And of course, sadly, the Conduit Club is no more um, as from last weekend. And then we've had three virtual uh, events, but this one is the most well attended. So thank you very much. And I think that says a lot about um, what we have learned in this very disrupted world this year and also um, how important this topic is. If you could keep going with the slides, Ashley, that would be great. So I'm James Bidwell. I um, am the chair of the UK Steering Committee for 1% for the Planet. I'm also the co-founder of Reset Advisory. We create world-class strategies uh, for our clients across innovation, sustainability, digital and cultural transformation. And I'm joined by an amazing steering committee group um, who we got together one year ago. Um, and we have, in that year, you will be pleased to know, we have doubled the amount of members of 1% for the planet uh, in the UK. So if we were in a live environment, I would hear the applause ricocheting off the walls, but I have great um, help on this. Um, there's Harry Lyon-Smith from Illustration X, Chris Ramsey from Pelican Founders, founders uh, Fred Clark from Moju, Madeline Postman, who is her own um, self and a brilliant sustainability expert. And then my uh, colleagues at Reset, uh, namely and notably Piotr Kowalczyk, who has helped me put all this together, and also Springwise, which is our other organization, um, an innovation intelligence platform, where you will find five takeaways from this event early next week if you want to have a look uh, for any kind of outputs from today. And what, our, what we're here to do is we are um, here to help grow this incredible movement in the UK and, and then further. Um, we're also ably uh, assisted by Ashley and Carla in the 1% for the Planet Office in the States, and they're really helping us um, pilot, I guess, the, um, the non-US 1% uh, movement. Just quickly going forward, um, some of you will know this and others if this is uh, maybe new to, to you, but the real, the real kind of benefit of 1% for the Planet or the raison d'etre is to make environmental giving easy and effective. And um, it goes like this, you commit to give 1% of your sales as a business to environmental causes. The 1% for the Planet team have accredited many organizations um, as recipients from that, uh, for that money. Uh, they accredit also the giving, uh, so organisations like Rewilding Britain is an accredited organisation, and that means that your money goes directly to, um, to have immediate impact uh, in environmental, uh, so to, to make the environment better. So it's a fantastic organisation, um, and you're going to learn more about uh, one of those partners today. Um, keeping going, so those of you, I mean, I'm sure everyone has, um, you know, knows Patagonia and knows the Yvonne Chouinard story, but he really is the example, the, the global leader in, um, in, a, in creating a business for purpose, which has been incredibly successful because of its underpinning values. Um, and it's not about phil philanthropy, actually, it's a cost of doing business, but it is also um, a, we think, um, and we're seeing it more and more across our reset clients, it is a huge competitive advantage to be in a business that is proactively caring um, for the environment. And as we all know, and many of us have um, benefited, from, benefited from, businesses profit from the Earth's resources, so really businesses should pay to protect them. And in the absence of any coherent global government approach to this, it really is up to us um, as business leaders and as individuals uh, to support this movement and get something done fast. We, we're a global community and again out of three and a half thousand in the U, U, um, global business members we're very proud that we've now hit 300 in the UK 
Uh, and you can see that there is a new movement of individual members as well. So there are now 689. That was launched earlier this year. Um, so you can become an individual member um, as well as uh, a business member. And the great thing is that there are for just over 4,000 fantastic nonprofit partners who you can contribute to. And that engagement with nonprofit partners is part of the power of the 1% for the Planet movement. So quickly, why, we know why we're here, the next slide. Um, it's more important than ever to do something about this. Um, you will have seen, most of you, I hope, the A Life on Our Planet, um, which is an incredible exposition of the, the problem that we are facing and the need to take action. And those of us with kids looking ahead um, to, to future generations, I think we all know that something has, has to happen now. And I was reflecting, we're kind of getting towards peak awareness maybe, but we're not at peak action, peak do something. So today we urge you, and Fred's gonna tell you at the end, you know, please do sign up, please do take part and do something. It's great when you write that check to the not-for-profit at the end of the year and say, I'm giving this cash to make our world better. And finally, um, being a member of 1% for the planet is really powerful for your business. So when you have that stamp, that logo, not only from a product point of view, and there's some great examples of that, not, not least Patagonia, but also Pucker Herbs in, in the UK. And we, we have that at, Re, at Reset and Springwise. Um, it's a great differentiator, but it is also a magnet for talent. So increasingly, um, particularly generations coming into the workforce, they want to work for businesses that care about this stuff. So there is a huge differentiating benefit for being part of 1% for the planet. So that is me. I'm handing to Fred. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the session. Great. Thank you, James. Hello, all, and welcome to this amazing event. Um, I am Fred Clark, and I work at Moju. I'm part of the ops and sustainability team there. Uh, Moju is a natural performance functional juice company and they've been part of 1% for the planet since 2017 and they're also part of the UK steering committee. As I said I am really excited today. I'm looking forward to learning about rewilding. We've got a fantastic speaker who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, yeah just very keen to learn more about rewilding and get into some of the issues. So the format of today um, we have Rebecca Wrigley, who will be going through a number of slides uh, introducing rewilding, and then I'll kick off uh, a Q&A where I've got a bank of questions, and then we'll go into some questions from you guys. So you, the audience, it'd be great if throughout the uh, event, you can put your questions into the chat if you've got any, um, and then at the end of the session, we'll try and answer some of those for you. So going on to our fantastic speaker, Rebecca Wrigley, who is Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Rewilding Britain. Uh, she's worked in the voluntary and public sector for the last 25 years and 15 years, which has been at the senior management level. During this time, she's developed, managed, implemented uh, conservation community programs at the local through to the international level. So we're in safe hands for this, uh, this journey today. On to you, Rebecca. Great. Um, let me just share my screen so that I've got that uh, sorted. Wait a minute. So, um, firstly, I just wanted to say a big thank you to 1% Planet for inviting me. It's, uh, it's quite a day for Rewilding Britain. It's quite kind of, um, uh, it, well, it's exciting times because um, this week we relaunched our website, relaunched our brand, we launched um, the Rewilding Network, which I'll tell you about uh, later, the first phase of it, um, and also a report on rewilding and climate adaptation. So, um, so you'll have to excuse me a little bit if I'm, my mind is a bit buzzing at the moment. Um, Before you jump uh, onto it, Rebecca, the um, slide isn't full screen. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Um, Perfect, yes, you. so uh, so you'll have to excuse if I'm uh, uh, slightly distracted. We've got sort of stuff coming up. It's just very, uh, you know, very exciting. It's an exciting week for Rewild in Britain. So I, I, I'm excited to share that enthusiasm. So I've been asking, uh, asked to talk about 
rewilding Britain's work, what rewilding is, um, and what our hopes for the future are. Um, and I suppose I want to start with what is rewilding. Um, for us, rewilding is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. So that's about restoring what we call natural processes uh, rather than focusing on individual species. So natural processes are things like letting rivers meander, um, reinstating tro trophic cascades and the, and the complexity of, of the food webs and the dynamic nature of kind of natural disturbance and the way that ecosystems shift and adapt and move and um, the complexity of that, including um, reintroducing missing species where that's necessary and appropriate. But it's also about, about people. Um, so for us, people are part of nature, um, not apart from it. Uh, and so what works for nature has to work for people too. So it's about flourishing ecosystems, but just as much about flourishing livelihoods and economics. Um, because if people aren't, aren't thriving, then nature can't thrive and, and vice versa. And it's about our living systems. All those things that we that we depend on um, for um, like um, flood mitigation and clean water and clean air um, we know we are totally dependent on that um, so that for us is what rewilding it is we at rewilding Britain have kind of defined five principles um, so again we we kind of start from the point that people are part of nature um, and it is about people and nature supporting each other um, and the balance between the two. I mean at the moment um, people are just you know humans are just one one animal within the ecosystem we're just taking up slightly more of, of the space than we uh, should do. Um, rewilding as I said is about working at nature's scale so that's about large areas and letting those natural processes function but it can be scaled through connectivity as much as scale through kind of large isolated areas from people so we'd love to see rewilding happen from people's doorsteps um, their gardens but going into local parks through river corridors maybe out into the countryside and out, out into those wilder more isolated areas um, it's about letting nature lead and i think that's quite what's sort of quite fundamentally different about um, rewilding in comparison with some more traditional conservation um, techniques which tend in Britain to be quite species orientated. For us it's about um, reinstating those processes and letting nature do what it does best. Um, you know nature is quite, care quite capable of taking care of itself, we just have to reinstate those natural processes and those missing species um, and kind of upgrade our ecosystems. Uh, I don't know if anyone's seen the amazing documentary The Serengeti Rules but it describes that amazing complexity um, of naturally functioning ecosystems and how important all the different species are, and particularly those keystone species. Um, and if you take keystone species out of the ecosystem, the whole thing can collapse um, and become downgraded. Um, and to, to upgrade our systems, our ecosystems, what we need to do is put that complexity back in and put those species back in. Um, but it is also, as I, as I mentioned, it's about creating resilient nature-based economies. And we think that that's a strength. Um, that could be about nature-based tourism, but it could be a, about other forms of production that, um, and land and marine uses that enhance nature. So low impact silver culture, for instance, or forms of highly extensive um, meat production. So it's a kind of mosaic, a rich mosaic of tapestry that we want to create. Uh, and to do so for the long term, so securing benefits um, for the for a long term future. Um, so benefits of rewilding. Well, um, a year ago we produced a report, or a year and a half ago, on the benefits of rewilding in relation to drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. And we know that naturally functioning ecosystems can draw a huge amount of carbon and store it um, as a natural climate solution. So we calculated that if we were to rewild about 30% of Britain, um, that could draw down the equivalent of about 10% of our current emissions. So it could over time have a significant impact and make a contribution towards achieving net carbon zero. Um, today we've released this report looking at um, rewilding and climate adaptation. So um, we've calculated that climate zones are moving 
at about five kilometers a year. So that's, I mean, when I first found that out, that's quite significant. Um, and what it's meaning is that wildlife is really struggling to keep up and adapt and move at, at, at the pace of, of climate heating. Um, but rewild, what's critical to, to enable species to move is to have um, high quality uh, habitat and connected habitat so that they can disperse and move into it rather than come up against barriers like in areas of intensive agriculture or roads or cities. Um, and so it's about, again, connecting up and increasing the quality of that habitat. And, um, and in doing so, we can help reverse biodiversity loss. Um, and I don't, it's, a, it's an often quoted figure, but still shocking that Britain or the UK is 189th of 218 countries in terms of biodiversity intactness. So we're one of the most nature loving countries on earth and watch um, nature programs in our millions, uh, but don't seem to see the connection between um, what's happening outside our, our, our windows and um, what, you know, the, the world that we kind of want to see. Um, but again, rewilding can support diversified nature-based economies. So we're going to produce a report on that quite soon. And, and this is the sort of fundamental basis of our, our health and, and well-being. So potentially lots of benefits. Um, and linked to that, you know, in terms of the climate and ecological emergencies, and as James mentioned earlier, we know that we need to act now um, and we need to upscale the kind of pace uh, and ambition of change. And that's very much where we kind of place ourselves. So um, rewilding Britain, what do we do? Well, we work in three areas. Um, we catalyze, so we're, we're helping to increase an upscale rewilding in practice across Britain's land and sea. Um, and we're doing that partly through setting up this rewilding network, which again, I'll talk about a bit more um, shortly. Um, we aim to influence change. So we'd like to see rewilding really mainstreamed into the way that the land and sea is managed in, in Britain um, and see government provide incentives and financial support and regulatory support for that to happen. Um, and we engage, so we want, we inform about rewilding and, and that's what the new website is all about. It's got a huge amount of more, more content about what rewilding is and what people can do to, to make rewilding happen. And we want to engage people in taking actions to sort of support um, rewilding um, and to, to help influence policy change. So those are the three areas that we're working on. And fundamentally, what we'd like to see is in relation to all of those things is, a, as I said, a kind of massive upscaling of uh, rewilding and nature's recovery across Britain um, and with a target of 30% by, by 2030. And of that, we'd like to see 5% core rewilding areas. So areas that are as much as is possible left um, to nature to take care of itself, reinstate those natural processes, um, reintroduce missing species where, where needed. Um, but we'd like to see that interspersed, interspersed with the mosaic of 25% of land and marine uses that enhance nature. So that, again, I think I mentioned earlier, that could be low impact silviculture um, or forms of production that mimic as, as far as is possible natural processes. So that we could create these corridors, what we're calling climate corridors, right from Cornwall to Case Mess, um, right up the spine of Britain, connecting through river corridors down to the coasts and right around our sea, seas. So we'd also like to see 30% of our in, inshore and offshore waters protected, but not just protected, um, enforced, because at, at the moment we have a lot of marine protected areas, but they're not enforced uh, and they're not regulated. So in a sense, they're paper parks. So again, upscale the ambition of, and pace of change. And so one of the things that we're doing as Rewilding Britain to support that is, you know, over the last couple of years, we've had a real upsurge in interest of people coming to us wanting to rewild or starting to rewild and wanting to know how to do that. Um, so what we've done, and again, we've just, just launched phase, phase one this week, um, is we've collected together um, a number of projects who are the kind of initial members of that network. And we're going to set up a web-based kind of collaborative learning platform so that people can um, find out more about rewilding, what they can do, they can learn from each other. Um, 
and they can start to con connect up um, initiatives. So you'll see there's a, there's a mapping function on the website already with at least um, 200,000 acres already. And that's just on day one uh, of people committing to rewilding. And we'd like to see that expand and start to create those climate corridors that swayed up Britain at 30% by 2030. Um, so the sort of milestones along the path of, of that network are we've launched phase one with some initial members where new members are joining all the time. We are starting to develop an interactive tools to help people make decisions about how to rewild their land and we'll be looking at um, how to rewild marine areas as well. Um, linked to a mapping app. Um, so we're in, uh, currently in conversation with people at the land app um, to see how they can support each other. So people can know much more about what they can do on a specific piece of land, what uh, species they might be able to reintroduce, what trees they might be able to, um, what kind of habitats might be able to regenerate there. Um, we want to set up an incubator fund. So we're seeing lots of projects, community-led projects, for instance, um, that are struggling in those early stages um, uh, with feasibility and getting support. So we want small-scale funding for those sorts of projects to get them to the point where they can, can apply and generate um, in larger amounts of funding. And so, you know, we're excited about initiatives like the, the Langham Initiative in the south of Scotland, which is a, a community buyout of land for the purposes of diversifying local livelihoods, but also um, rewilding and reversing biodiversity loss. So there's lots of kind of exciting things coming along. So we'll be setting up an online kind of discussion forum, webinars, um, training courses, that, uh, that kind of thing, a directory of rewilding experts, um, with the aim that within two to three years, it will be financially self-sustaining. Um, so that's the rewilding network. Um, so what can, can you do as, uh, um, well, you know, invest in a wilder future is what I would say. Um, we're looking for investment into the development of, and growth of that rewilding network and the rewilding incubator fund and to support kind of mapping and interactive tools. Um, we're also looking for people to join the call, to get behind that kind of 30% by 2030 and to help create those climate corridors right up up Britain but in a sense we're also wondering about um, rewilding yourself uh, both in the sense of as a person but also if you have access to land or know people that have access to land to try and spread the message and encourage people to get be to, to become part of this so we want to create a kind of movement um, of coordinated locally led action that starts to create and evolve into this, um, uh, you know, higher ambition for change. And, you know, we're getting approaches from, you know, everyone from rewilding your garden to rewilding two or three acres to those that have large estates, but also public landowners um, uh, and corporate landowners. So, you know, again, I think if we can get this momentum going, um, we really can achieve, uh, large-scale change. Um, so what I wanted to end with is, again, James mentioned it earlier, um, two quotes from David Attenborough this year. You know, we need to learn how to work with nature rather than against it. And, and he, um, his, you know, we must rewild the world. So it's about us all playing our part and doing what we can. So I think that's probably enough for me. I mean, what I'd be really keen um, is to hear your thoughts and ideas and to get the kind of discussion going. Um, uh, you know, I, that's, that's the bit that I'm, I'm really interested in sharing that discussion and ideas. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was very insightful. Seemed to cover a lot of ground and it seems like Rewilding Britain are doing a huge amount at the moment. Um, really looking forward to seeing what that network brings in the future. Um, so, like I said before, I, I've got some questions which we'll jump into while we're just collecting uh, questions from the audience as well. So I will jump into one that's probably a, closer to my heart than, than most. Um, having grown up on the farm, uh, something that always comes to my mind is how, how do you balance food production 
with rewilding. It seems like there's a little bit at odds between the two. Is there a compromise? And if so, what, what is that? It's a good question. Um, well, we don't feel that there is a, a need to compromise because, you know, not least because large areas of Britain are not currently producing food. So um, we've got 1.4 million hectares of grouse shooting estates. Um, we've got 1.8 million hectares of uh, deer stalking estates. So that's bet between the two is, I think, it, I think it's about 20% of, of Britain that is not currently um, in food production. Um, we've got 350,000 hectares of, I think it's in England alone, of golf courses. Um, and a lot of the farming land is um, is marginal land, so it's it's not very productive for food, but could be very productive for um, all the benefits that rewilding can bring. But it's also about creating a, a mosaic, um, a sort of patchwork and tapestry of different land uses. Some areas that are core areas, but some areas that um, can be productive. And there are forms again, as I mentioned, of low impact silver culture that can be productive because we need to produce timber, but also forms of extensive grazing. That can be profitable to to farmers, um, but can also produce um, some meat. Not, you know, high levels of productivity, but yes. Um, so, so, you know, we don't see it as as a as a decision between food production and rewilding. There's a huge amount of space to play with, uh, to work with, and a huge amount of common ground that can be found between those who live and ma manage the land, between farmers and foresters and fishers. Um, and it's not nearly as polarised as, as some have made out over the last few years. Okay, great. So if, if, a, if a typical farmer came, came to you and they wanted to maintain food production, do you, have a, do you have a model that they can follow on how they can keep food production going while moving on to rewilding? I mean, it's interesting because we were just had, uh, this morning we had a conversation with uh, the guys at the Land App who are also working with farmers and they're linked into the new um, environmental environmental land management scheme about it's basically it's, it's a mapping app to help landowners to make decisions about how they want to manage their land. Um, so it can be, you know, the rewilding is a, is a spectrum as we see it. Um, uh, and it could be everything from setting aside some areas of land to rewild or working in a way that um, is reinstating as many natural processes as possible, like some forms of extensive grazing, for instance. Um, so we're working to kind of um, help provide those tools to help, help people make those decisions, I think. But it's also about, you know, the incentives that the government provides. Um, so we're really supportive of the way that the environmental land management scheme is, is shaping up, because what it's saying is that landowners should be supported for the for the broader public goods that they provide and not just for their production. Um, so landowners, you know, it could be forms of diversification as well as, so combination of, of public support for public goods, um, forms of diversification like nature-based tourism, but also forms of um, nature-based products, you know. I mean, for instance, who would have thought that gin would be um, a niche product? We could have kind of rewilding gin <laughs> products around the country using wild forage products, for instance. So there's lots of, you know, new products that could be developed and new ways of, of, of managing the land uh, and new forms of productivity. This would be my last farming question. <laughs> um, one, one issue I hear about the Elms Agreement um, is that currently farmers rely heavily on subsidies and that allows them to do what they do. Um, and one worry that I have heard with Elms is that it's, it is focusing so much on the rewilding side that food production could reduce in Britain and us heading into Brexit is another issue as well which you know, do you see that Elms is going to reduce food production and, and us importing from Brexit uh, sorry from Brexit and, and importing from the EU do you see that as, as an issue? I mean that we are going to make you know that there are wider choices that we need to make and you know fundamentally it's about what we're asking of, of the land and sea. Food production is, is one of those things um, and we are going to make have to make some difficult choices. Um, 
but if we make uh, you know including things like the the amount of um, meat that people eat for instance and the amount of land that is dedicated to producing meat um, so you know we, we can't get away from the fact that there are some stock choices but we don't think that it's as much of a compromise as as again is, is being the picture that is being painted so um, so I you know I mean it, it's it's complex um, but I don't see food production being reduced significantly because where it's productive um, landowners can can make a profit um, but what I suppose I, I think in terms of the environmental land management scheme is that um, we wouldn't impose on on any landowner what they should be doing on their land but it's what incentives that that public money um, is going towards that is um, that can provide different forms of support and again it goes back to that question of what are we asking of the land and sea yes we're asking for it to produce food but there now is a climate and ecological emergency um, that you know again if we don't address that we, the impact on our ability to, pr to produce food will be massive um, at a kind of even at a 1.5 degree um, increase in global temperatures that's going to have an impact it, in itself on agriculture in Britain at, at 3.5 agriculture starts to become inviable yeah great thank you um, something that was really stuck out with me from your presentation is that the UK is so far behind other countries uh, in biodiversity why are we so far behind oh, there's, yeah, yeah there's a um, you know we've been changing in a way um, that is quite different from the rest of Europe of you know over a long period of time so I mean it is true that a lot of our forests um, were cut down hundreds of years ago if not in some places thousands so that <laughs> god i that's a there's a you could write a, a phd or a you know um your, a book on that topic i think you know historical land use is is one current land use is another you know again i think it's quite stark the figure of how much land is dedicated to grouse shooting and deer stalking uh, and we're the only country in the world that manages our land for hunting in that way uh, I don't know of any other country that does that. Um, so I, I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that question. Very complex issue. <laughs> yeah. So, is it, so it seems like the government is trying to uh, fix that or at least make, make some steps on it. So they've, re they've announced that protecting 30% of the UK's land and sea by 2030. Do you see this as a big step or empty words? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's great that they stated an ambition, but the way that they have stated that they're going to achieve it is by increasing national the area of national parks by four percent. So at the moment, apparently, it's twenty. I think I've got the figures right. It's twenty six percent, and they want to increase it to thirty. But if you look at the state of our national parks, that's not really going to have much of an impact um, because uh, because our national parks are, are largely farmed landscapes. Um, you know, I, I hear that we a new category was created by the IUCN that kind of grades national parks grade five because none of the none of our national parks fit into any of the other categories so I think I'm encouraged that they've expressed an aspiration to increase nature's recovery across Britain but it has to be more than just paper parks and nominal figures of the areas that are defined as national parks and in terms of making way with rewilding in Britain, what do you see as the biggest barrier, the biggest challenge? Is it is it communities? Is it funding, or is it something else? I, it's, a, it's a combination. I mean, it, it's kind of we need that coordinated local action, and we need that to be supported, and we need a, an enabling environment provided by government through regulatory and funding support. Um, I think, you know, the pos I think Brexit in in some ways is um, provides opportunities, not least because we, it, it means we leave the common agricultural policy, which you know, in the, one of the first meetings of rewilding Britain 
um, five, when we were set up five years ago, we discussed what the barriers to rewilding are. And the, the biggest thing that people mentioned was the common agricultural policy because it provides incentives to you know, maintain intensified um, agricultural land uses. Um, so there are um, opportunities um, and I think we need to, I mean, I, I suppose that's, that's why that kind of catalyzed function. We feel if we can get this movement um, of locally led action starting to evolve, but we can also hold government and, and public bodies to account. I mean, we'd love to see, for instance, 30% of all public land and all national parks as core, established as core rewilding areas. I mean, that's what national parks are about. Uh, and it sh should be um, what um, is included in their management plans. Um, so we'd like government and public lands to show the way, but we'd also like to support that kind of, again, that upsurge in, uh, and that movement for, for change. Everyone can play their part, everyone can um, do what they can on their own land, and, and together that can start to sort of shift and change into um, what could be potentially large scale change. It's a beautiful vision. I, I want to <laughs> live in it. <laughs> So some, one of the uh, things that really excites me about rewilding is just imagining coming into this natural land and you, and you see the ecosystem as it, as it should be or as close as it can be. And part of that is introducing predators. Um, um, so I'm really interested to talk, how do you, obviously you can't just, end, you can't just drop a predator into, a, into an area and then, you know, job done, it's all great. What are the steps, if you, if you were given, let's say, a national park that we've just talked about having low biodiversity, what would be the steps you take? Where would the predator drop in? What do you have to do after that? Or is it you can just sit back and, and let it happen? I mean, I think we do. the thing about rewilding is you have to take a holistic approach and look at the whole ecosystem. Um, so, I mean, of course, the emphasis has been about, it's, you know, it being about predators and reintroducing predators, but actually, that's the sort of icing on the cake or the cherry on the, you know, on, on the cake. Um, what is required is kind of re starting to reinstate those natural processes and, and using natural regeneration wherever possible. You know, I mean, one of the things that has frustrated us and, and we're actually just about to produce a report on it is the extent to which, um, is the extent of the emphasis, for instance, in tree planting as opposed to natural regeneration of, of woodlands. We don't actually have to plant trees in most places in Britain. Um, and I know people love to plant trees because they can count them and they can go and plant them themselves. But actually, what we c can rely on is basically what we need to do is kickstart um, natural regeneration. Um, uh, I mean, that can be a very hands off approach if you know, if you say with trees, if you've got seed sources and and the ground is is disturbed and, and trees can start to regenerate, but in some places you might just need to kickstart it, give it a helping hand. And in some circumstances, yes, tree planting is appropriate. Um, and then it's about identifying what are those sort of missing keystone species. So the obvious ones in Britain, of course, but of course, a, a, a beaver uh, and boar because wild boar, because of the function that they play in sort of disturbing the ground. Um, but also larger herbivores like um, um, kind of cattle that play the function of the, the wild aurochs, which is now extinct. Um, ponies, um, bison maybe. I mean, they, they've been reintroduced in an enclosure in Kent, I think. Um, so those are the sorts of species that we want to start to put back into that ecosystem to start to get that those trophic cascades and that those food webs re-established and it's that that's it's about the kind of complexity and the functional and structural complexity of that gives biodiversity that its abundance and its its sort of wealth as it were so that's what you have to start to think about doing uh, you know and that includes allowing rivers to meander um, uh, uh, allowing, you know, fire, for instance, as a natural disturbance. I mean, obviously that has um, implications um, in some places, but it's also about rewetting bogs. Um, uh, so again, it's a focus on, on those natural processes rather than looking at individual species, which is, you know, currently what predominantly happens in, in Britain. Fantastic. 
great. Um, I'm going to look at some audience questions. Um, so just bear with me while I gather some of those together. So we've got a first question from John Elkington is, uh, what do you think of James Dyson's bollocks to rewilding theme? <laughs> good one to start on. Oh, good one to start. Um, well, and if you could give, uh, sorry, if you could also give a little bit of background to what the bollocks to rewilding theme is, um, that'd be great as well. Not have, never having discussed it with um, Mr. Dyson, I, I'm not exactly sure, I, you know, uh, what his thinking behind the bollocks to rewilding is. Um, so what um, I've said, so what I've got from a very brief view is. Um, He's recently published an article, which people might have seen, um, that rewilding is basically a waste of land. Um, yeah, I don't know if you if you know more than that. Um, well, I suppose again, it comes back to the question of what are we asking of, of the land and sea, um, and it can only be a waste based on the answer to that question. So, um, for me, I think. Um, we want the land and sea to provide multiple benefits um, and at the moment it's it's not doing that I mean again the figure of 189th out of 218 countries in terms of biodiversity and techness is kind of speaks for itself so yeah I, I, I'm not sure where um, James Dyson is coming from on that um, but I, I would well I, I don't suppose you'd be surprised to hear that I disagree <laughs> no I'm not really <laughs> Um, let me just scan through for another question. Um, how much, uh, so if I'm right, uh, rewilding for Britain, um, rewilding Britain was founded five years ago. To what extent are the charities, uh, nature charities and NGOs coordinating their efforts around rewilding in, in the UK? That's another good question. Um, I mean, we are, what we like to do is work in kind of um, loose alliances. Um, I think I think it would probably be fair to say that many larger conservation organisations have been dragging their feet a bit on this issue. I think initially, well, I mean, when we set up, we we basically consulted with as many people as possible within the conservation sector and more broadly about one whether it was worth setting up a new organization um because you know god only knows we've got many already um so we didn't want to kind of um reinvent the wheel um and two if if the answer you know if, if it is worth setting up an organization what should its value what would its value added be and most people said yes because we need an organization that is that is able to say the things that we aren't currently able to say and push the boundaries of, of the debate and help catalyze rewilding in practice so I think a lot of the conservation organizations have been reluctant to, to use the rewilding word. Um, and we're pretty disappointed in that, I have to say. But I think there is now, um, you know, there seems to be a moment of change, even for those organizations, like a lot of the wildlife trusts, for instance, are getting behind rewilding. And some of, I think two of the projects on our um, on the rewilding network as initial members are wildlife trusts, as is Wick and Friend, for instance, which is an RSPB um, project and projects of the John Muir Trust in in um, Scotland. So things are changing, but I think I think conservation organisations have been almost inherently conservative in Britain, and again, that's quite different from in in other countries and the way that conservation organisations operate. And slightly related to that, we've got a question basically saying, is Britain a mutant in its interest in rewilding? Or do you see other countries going the same route? How does Britain deviate from, from other countries in, in rewilding? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of interest. Um, I mean, there's rewilding Europe, so there's a lot of work going on across Europe. Um, there's amazing work that um, organisations like Tompkins Conservation are doing in um, in southern in South America, in Patagonia and, and Chile. So um, I wouldn't say it was 
it was unique to Britain at all. Um, we're working very closely with rewilding Europe. I mean, I think there probably are you know, difference, differences in Britain, partly due to the fact that we're an, an island. Um, so in, in Europe, wildlife comeback is, is just happening naturally in many places. I mean, there are breeding packs of wolves in Holland and, uh, and Belgium, um, you know, which have a much higher population density to, to e even to ours. Um, there's large scale land abandonment in Europe that as isn't currently happening in Britain. So, you know, I think, I think rewilding needs to happen within each particular context, which is why we kind of really keen to have principles of rewilding and allow people to, to adapt the application of those principles based on, on each context um, and what works best in that, in that context. For instance, the context in Scotland is clearly different from in England and, and also in, in Wales. So I, I think there is a growing movement. Um, I think the, the rewilding, I mean, we were having a conversation with um, people who've been working in conservation in places like Africa, um, where it's, it's not, you know, other forms of conservation are, are used there, partly because, you know, they still have wilder areas there, uh, you know, in a, in a way that we've lost. Um, but it does feel, you know, in the five years that we've been operating, the difference has been transformational, you know, and, it, and it, I think David Attenborough's quote um, really accentuates that. I mean, he was interviewed, I think, three or four years ago, I didn't exactly dismiss rewilding, but didn't wholeheartedly embrace it. And for him to have come out with his um, witness statement and have rewilding pretty central to that witness statement just shows the, the extent of change that has happened over the last five years. Definitely. And the level of awareness, it seems to just be growing and growing. Um, and another question, what support is there for small landowners, say up to 10 acres, wanting to rewild? There's a lot of talk on it being doing it at nature's scale, but you have mentioned, you know, having small ones and the connectivity. What support do we have for smaller landowners? Well, I mean, what we've aimed to do with the new website is provide as much content as possible for people at all scales. Um, because each, each everyone can make a contribution, particularly you may have, it may be your garden or it may be you have 10 acres. Um, 10 acres in, in itself is quite difficult to, to restore natural processes to an extent, but starting to connect up with your neighbors uh, and take a common approach um, could be really significant. And again, as I said, it, it, it could be that, that we start neighborhood rewilding groups where everyone takes a similar approach in their gardens and then contacts their um, council and says, you know, we'd like our, our local park uh, and our grass verges to, um, to be rewilded. And then people could start looking at those river corridors leading out of cities into the countryside. And um, so what we're trying to do, and we've put quite a lot of new content up already, is provide information for people um, to know what they can do at, at whatever scale that they're able to. But again, it's, it's connecting those, those little initiatives up that is, I think is going to make a real difference. Um, and we know from the report that we produced, that we released today, that it's, again, it's it, even in terms of climate adaptation and, and providing the kind of habitat and connectivity for species to disperse into as, as they have to move north, um, we can provide micro it, refugia as much as large areas of core rewilding that act as stepping stones. So it's, it's all valuable and valid. And, um, you know, over, over the next um, months and years, we will be providing as much content as possible to um, enable people to put re rewilding into practice at whatever scale they are able to. And uh, just one, probably just time for two questions. This is probably one of the very last ones. Going even smaller again, um, urban areas. We want people to get closer to nature. Rewilding might seem a very abstract thing to them. How, how are we applying it in an urban area? Is it different or, yeah, what do you say? Um, I mean, I think I sort of touched on that just, just now. I mean, I, I think it is really important and not least um, because it's where people, people's connection to nature starts, really. Um, not everyone can go out to, um, the, the Lake District or to the north of Scotland or to areas where 
where large scale rewilding is, is possible. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to connect those areas into our cities. So, you know, a really good example would be Sheffield and the Peak District. So we're working with Derbyshire Wildlife Trust and others on this Wild Peak project. Um, and the aim there is very much to connect with them. And people in Sheffield are very connected with, with the peaks. I mean, a lot of people go, go there and experience nature, but it's, again, it's sort of consciously trying to, to build that connect, connectivity. Um, so down from the peaks through the river valleys into the parks of Sheffield and potentially into um, actions that people can take in their garden. Um, but there's also a lot of um, really interesting kind of urban design projects looking at um, even at small scale uh, what natural processes can be restored at those scales and again building that connectivity can make one relatively small initiative start to scale up into something that um, has a big impact. I love the vision you're selling. <laughs> 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 so the uh, one last question: How can this audience help? If you were to ask us to do one thing, what would be the one thing you you want us to do? Oh, can I have two? Okay, I'll give you two. Go on, if you're lucky. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think you know, in the, in the slide I presented, um, you know, we're really looking for support. To, to, to sort of grow this movement um, and to grow our ability to, you know, we don't want it all to depend on us, but we want to be that catalyst and provide interactive tools and support um, and networking and connections that start to build this into a movement for change. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, and we're, you know, within that, we're wanting also to stay small um, because we, we think that kind of makes us dynamic and innovative and, and creative. So, um, and we're also aware that um, in the next few years, we want to build a business model that makes itself sustaining so that it's not, you know, we're not constantly looking for external funding um, for the rewilding network. But I think, so that's the one thing. And then the second thing is I think everyone can play their part um, as an individual um, and through wherever you work and through influencing government. So people can take actions, you know, whatever land that you might have access to, or you may have friends that have access to, start to kind of get people inspired and enthused about what each person can do um, as an individual. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I think we are at the end of our time for questions and we've covered a lot, gone through what rewilding is, how to do it, uh, UK's role in it and how, how we differ from, from others uh, and the rewilding network and how we can all help. So I really appreciate your time. It's been uh, an, an amazing hour to, to go through all that. So thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for, for being here, for joining. Thank you. And, um, but we cannot forget why we are here today. We are, James hit on it at the beginning, we have hit a climate crisis. We are at that crisis point. And without organizations like Rewilding Britain, we would be facing a very bleak future. And with the help of 1% for the planet, where it is fueling and, and providing um, fuel for these non-profits like Rewilding Britain, it really helps us create that impact and get to the place where we need to be. So you guys here today, clearly you care about that. And if I could have one point I can ask you as well, similar to Rebecca, it is please consider becoming a business member or an individual member for 1% for the planet. And one of the most important things is word of mouth. So do use your network, talk to someone. Imagine if everyone here watching today could convince one person uh, to become a member or a business member for 1% for the planet, and then they could uh, uh, fund Rewilding Britain through that. So that is it. We've had, uh, we've gone through a lot and we've, we've come to the end of the time. There will be a recording of this video sent out shortly along with a survey. So any feedback you have, please do send it our way through that. But once again, thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.